All right, well, let's get started. Welcome everybody to our webinar this evening on clean energy proposals and real climate solutions. I'm Mitch Jones, Policy Director at Food and Water Watch, and it's really great to have you all with us here tonight. We have a great panel for you this evening to discuss what a renewable energy standard should be and what it shouldn't. Now, this is a debate that's happening right now in Congress. It's very timely. This is literally a debate going on now in DC. As many of you are no doubt aware, a few weeks ago, over 700 national, regional, state, and local organizations sent a letter to Congress outlining what should be in a truly renewable energy standard. But unfortunately, most of the energy standards proposed so far missed that mark. The varying proposals would allow fracked gas to be counted as clean, and some of the proposals would allow actually uh, the majority of current gas-fired electric power plants to keep running, even without the fossil fuel industry boondoggle known as carbon capture. Beyond greenwashing frack gas, these proposals also contain other forms of dirty energy and false climate solutions. They would allow the burning of biomass and factory farm gas. They would promote so-called advanced nuclear energy, which even if it worked, wouldn't be ready at scale in anything like the time frame needed to avert the worsening climate, climate chaos that we witness daily. They would rely on credit trading schemes that allow polluters and frontline communities to buy offsets and credits from others while continuing to pollute their local environment and harm their local communities. In recent days, we've seen a flurry of members of Congress rally to the cry of no climate, no deal. And we agree, but we must go further. Fracked gas, no deal. Carbon capture, no deal. Biomass, no deal. Factory farm gas, no deal. Climate justice, deal. Environmental justice, deal. Truly confronting the fossil fuel industry and stopping all new fossil fuel in infrastructure, deal. Now, that's enough from me. As I said, we have a great panel this evening. We will be answering questions in the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and we will be turning off the chat. However, at the end of the webinar, time permitting, we will also answer questions directly from the panel. Now, first of all, we will hear from Candy White. Candy is a leading voice in the fight to bring visibility to the impacts that climate change and environmental injustice are having on indigenous communities across North America. She is currently the Indigenous Environmental Network's lead organizer on the Extreme Energy and Just Transition campaign focusing on creating awareness about the environmentally and socially devastating effects of hydraulic factoring on tribal lands and working towards a just transition away from the fossil fuel industry. Candy. Hi there, and thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm going to share um, a presentation, some slides along with my my talk as I go along, because I'm a very visual learner, always have been, and I like to share what it is I'm talking about. And so and first I'll introduce myself in my language and say, Dosha Maraguetz, Marishi Ma'a Ishuya Hetz. So in my Hiradza language, I said, hello, relatives. My name is Eagle Woman. My English and married name is Candy White, and I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you a little bit about my history, to explain how these environmental justice injustices keep occurring when we talk about um, clean energy standards that aren't clean, that aren't focused on renewable energies, which is what is happening right now, as was already explained. I am from um, North Dakota on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, which it was called by the federal government, home of the Mandan Hidatsa Rikra nations. And we have been dealing with fracking in my community, and it's a little bit different than fracking in other areas because of the fact that the natural gas there, some of it is being captured, a lot of it is being flared, they're fracking for oil, but many of the problems in fracking are the exact same. Like I said, <laughs> a lot of flaring going on, um, which is kind of 
ironic considering that they're saying this is a bridge fuel and in North Dakota they're just burning it into the atmosphere and what that has allowed us to see is that methane is a huge problem in the atmosphere in a very very horrific gas in the atmosphere 26 times more potent than carbon dioxide in fact and that is a byproduct of this industry um, this is a NASA space picture showing the Bakken flaring over in North Dakota. Those aren't lights, that's gas. And when we're around this toxic industry, not even by the flares, just by the tanks, the holding tanks, the areas where they're drilling, we get these signs that say, danger, poisonous gas might be present. And so you hold your breath. How long can you hold your breath? <laughs> you know, so breathing in the industry's air and seeing all over the place these rigs. And instead of the wheat fields, North Dakota was the breadbasket of the country feeding the rest of our country. We now see industrial zone signs and we see our wheat fields being contaminated because of a fossil fuel industry. That's what natural gas is. It is a fossil fuel along with the oil. There's a huge problem in the food chain when it comes to fracking. We have had incidents on the reservation where horses and cattle have dropped dead. They've been covered up, they've been hidden, and that's from the water that they're drinking. The millions and millions and millions of gallons of water that goes into fracking uh, for natural gas and for oil, which then becomes contaminated and toxic. Can't drink it, and when you do, you could die. We have all kinds of spills every single day in the fossil fuel industry. This kind of... Um, so-called clean energy standard will allow this to continue. It will allow trucks to continue to dump produced frac toxic poisonous water right on our highways, right on our roads. It will allow spills to continue to happen where grass years later, this was in 2014, this is the grass years later still isn't growing because that's how toxic those chemicals are. There's radioactive materials, there's radioactive fluids, there's all of these things that are not by any means clean at all. We just got a brand new radioactive repository, depository site by Wofford City, North Dakota, where my sister lives with her four young children. This is a picture of the water that I took out of Lake Sakakawea, which is a reservoir of the Missouri River created by the Garrison Dam. This is not changed in any way, shape or form. This was what the water looked like one mile from our water intake plant. I took it to the North Dakota State Health Department, paid $200 out of pocket for them to tell me, don't worry, it's just a blue green algae bloom. Little did I know you're not supposed to swim in it, you're not supposed to drink it. And this has been happening all the time as a result of fracking that has been happening in my community. We all know, we should know at this point that water is life, especially after Standing Rock, you know, we would battle cry mini Wichoni. And it's not just a, a saying, you know, it's a reality. There's, it's no coincidence that when we're pregnant, our first life, everybody's first life is in water when we're carried inside of our mothers. Oh, I, I forgot I had that in there. I do have two children. Um, this was when I was pregnant with my second child. Um, my second child is what a lot of people call a rainbow baby. That's because I lost my child before him. You see on the reservation, mm, low birth weights, children being born with heart defects, children being born with serious problems, and women having miscarriages is quite common. Um, and we have been in the middle of fracking development since 2007. And so when my friend's son was born, um, they kept him alive as long as they could. Six months, he made it. But his heart was too damaged to be able to survive. And she lived within a mile of a fracking site. You can read more about it in the compendiums that are put out if you want to learn more about the harms of fracking. I pulled out some of the specific things that happen when it comes to um, gas extraction. The one of the scariest things that I want you to note from this, I know it's a lot of text, is that there are endocrine disruptors when it comes to the fossil fuel industry, fracking in particular. And so women, girls, people that haven't even had kids yet already have their endocrines being disrupted by fracking operations. And it affects our ability to reproduce and in a way that is healthy and normal. 
if you want to talk about, you know, environmental injustices, let's talk about my little niece, for example, who was born with Down syndrome, and then my little nephew that came after him, they still don't know for sure what's wrong with him. They can't pinpoint why these children in mass numbers are being born with, with different problems, with different impacts. On top of that, man camps come whenever there's industry, whenever there's natural gas, whenever there's fracking, whenever there's whatever you have it. it it's not a clean energy standard and it's not an issue of justice when you have thousands and thousands of men coming into your communities causing harms. These are just regular headlines that I took from our local newspapers that you won't see in mainstream media about the deaths and the murders and the incidents of violence that come along with any fossil fuel industry like that of natural gas, like that of fracking. We also have a problem that happened with um, people being becoming addicted to drugs. We did not have the level of drugs that we did do now on the reservation prior to the oil boom, the fracking boom coming to our reservation. These are my friends. Lisa here, Ashley here. This is my cousin, Daniel. All of them became addicted to heroin because of MS-13 coming to our communities after the fracking boom came. There was no help for them. They all died. Lisa and Ashley, were in the hospital for days before their hands and feet turned black. And then they passed on. Lisa left behind five kids. Daniel left behind one. It also encourages racism when you have energy standards that aren't clean, like the fossil fuel industry. This was found by some third and fourth graders on our dumpster in Mandaree. North Dakota, right in the heart of the oil boom, fracking boom. And so we took off to Standing Rock. We decided to stand in solidarity to say, we are telling you what actually environmental justice means. As a result, we went up against our own police forces. We had people who were severely injured. I should have warned you before this. I'm sorry about this slide, but this is the reality of what happens when you stand up against the industry and against what's already in place to say, hey, we want clean water. We all know how that ended. We were forcibly removed out of Standing Rock because of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which moves oil, which comes from the Bakken, which also has to do with fracking. That's how they're tied and connected. So moving on to what we do want, renewable energy standards, right? We have the ability to have solar small scale distributed solar we're already working on it through native renewables and other companies over by standing rock people didn't hear about the huge solar panel that was put out there about three miles from the pipeline but it's there now we have the ability to bring indigenous women together from all over the world working with a lovely organization called madre to talk about our common struggles and that's what we need to do is to be able to connect with each other to move forward in a way that allows a just transition away from the fossil fuel industry. That's what this picture is all about. Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas had a just transition assembly and are currently integrating just transition as a program within their college courses and curriculum, working with the Indigenous Environmental Network to make it happen. We have the indigenous principles of just transition and what that means and how you can change it to make it impact you in a way that makes the most sense. And we're doing it for our babies. For me personally, it's a cultural thing. She's standing inside an earth lodge right now. These are our traditional homes that we used to live in. This is a little more modern, you know, with the cement floor, but we're going to use this as a cultural site, an interpretive center to teach people our culture and our history, which is often erased by negative impacts of industry. And I just show this to show that fracking isn't just happening, of course, where I am up there in North Dakota, it's happening across the United States. In fact, it's happening around the world. All that water, millions of gallons per frack job being poisoned, all of that social problems that comes with the industry happening all over the world. We need to protect our future generations now more than ever before. We all know that, you know, we have to take just climate policies into account because we're looking ahead seven generations, not just, oh, how am I gonna be impacted in my life? 
We all know the only way to do that, the only way to realistically do that is to keep fossil fuels in the ground. So we don't have to sequester them later as a result, another false solution to the climate crisis. As a mom, I do that for my babies, my little Ayana and my little winter eagle. But it's, even if you don't have kids, you gotta do it for all those that can't speak for themselves. The wildlife, the four-legged, the winged, all those that swim in those waters that are being contaminated, they need you and they need us. And we need you in our communities to help us fight against an industry that's doing those things that I showed you. So sorry if I went over time, um, but Matsugirats, thank you. Thank you, Candy, for that incredibly powerful testimony about the impacts of fracking, uh, not only in your community, but amongst your friends, your family, and yourself. Uh, this is the industry we're fighting against, folks, and Candy's presentation is one of the most powerful that I've ever seen about the direct impacts of fracking. And that's why we have to make sure that any energy standard passed by Congress does not include fracked gas. Our next speaker is Kathy England. Kathy has served on the board of the NAACP since 1998 and has served as the chair of the board's Environmental and Climate Justice Committee since the ECJ program was established in 2010. As a resident of Gulfport, Mississippi, Kathy has survived two of the country's greatest climate and energy related disasters, Hurricane Katrina and the BP Horizon oil spill. Additionally, she was motivated by the highly acclaimed NAACP research report, Coal Blooded, Putting Profits Before People, that cited a failing coal plant located less than five miles from her home. She immediately went into action organizing trainings and town hall meetings through her local Gulfport NAACP branch. And that campaign succeeded in closing the coal burning operation at Plant Watson in April of 2015. Kathy. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Candy, uh, for that powerful presentation. I'm going to talk a bit about wood pellets energy this evening. First, let me quickly explain that wood pellets is a process that clear cuts trees from our forest, tightly compresses them into tiny pellets that looks like capsules. And these pellets are then shipped to other countries to be burned for energy. The manufacturing of wood pellets is a clear cut case of environmental injustice. And I'm going to tell you the downright ugly truth about its harmful and racist impacts in the southeastern US. I'm going to explain how the race against time and the admirable intent to achieve the mandate of 1.5 C has resulted in dishonorable, despicable racial transgressions that we must not ignore. I'm sorry, transgressions. Thank you for listening with open minds and open hearts. And I hope that you are motivated to reject this false misleading climate solution that ultimately amounts to putting profit over people. And I ask that you are motivated to reject the notion that wood pellets energy is a viable, safer alternative to fossil fuel and understand that it is in fact an extremely harmful, toxic process that not only equally, if not more harmful uh, than fossil fuel, but it also destroys our inv invaluable forests and further imper imperils vulnerable communities. The wood pellets industry should be charged with committing crimes against humanity and our regulatory agencies are guilty of accessory by aiding and abating and supporting racism. The manufacturing of wood pellet poses significant dangers to human health from toxic levels of exposures of emissions to particulates, volatile organic compounds, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methanol, formaldehyde. Some might say that we're currently facing a pandemic, but let me assert to you that BIPOC communities are confronting a syndemic that includes COVID, unprecedented climate disasters, heightened civil and racial 
unrest, and an economic downturn that will undoubtedly further disproportionately disenfranchise Black, Brown, and Indigenous populations. With pellets industries are coming into our communities making idle promises, they're feeding off the desperation of the poorest of the poor by pledging economic prosperity, jobs, without acknowledging that the few jobs created will be lost as soon as the forests have been decimated. They're claiming that the process is safe and that they're taking the necessary precautions to safeguard community health and well-being when the reality is that nothing can be further from the truth. They have skillfully and deliberately targeted the southeastern U.S. to commit their dirty deeds because of lax environmental regulatory oversights and the high unemployment rates, the low monitoring threshold, the high poverty rates, the low cost of doing business, the high percentage of minority populations, which they see as being expendable, and the low level of awareness and concern about who is harmed in the process of achieving global warming well below 1.5. And let's be realistic, we do have to achieve that, but we have alternate safer alternatives. There's a local to global connection to this injustice. These wood pellets are destroying our forests and poisoning our communities on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, but being shipped to be used for energy on the other side of the Atlantic. And the irony of all of this is that the use of wood pellets is a false solution that will not get us to the 1.5 C goal. Because of the climate agreement rule books, because of loopholes in the rule book on double counting, the use of wood bioenergy is not being counted. So let me emphasize, there are still carbon emissions from the cutting to the burning process. And most scientists have warned that biomass emits more carbon than coal. It's just that those are emissions are not allowed to be counted, giving us a false solution by simply ignoring those emissions. And the leading wood pellet manufacturers are all based in other countries. The world's largest is Drax, based in the United Kingdom with subsidiary offices across the globe. Drax was recently levied the largest fine to date by the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. But let's put that in perspective. It was a meager two and a half million dollar fine for eight years of pollution. That's the equivalent of one day's profit at that plant for eight years of pollution. And I, I too have photos of little children playing in the shadows of that plant that can't be any more than eight years old, which means they have been exposed to pollution all their lives. And this was in a very small town in Mississippi with a little over 1,100 residents, 82% African-American with a 58% poverty rate. These are the locations that they target to do their dirty deeds. People should not accept these false solutions that might put food on the family's table in the short term while digging their graves in the long term. We must be about a just transition, not just a transition. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I wanna um, highlight one of, one of the things that I heard Kathy say that I think a lot of people don't realize is that biomass, wood pellets, what Kathy was talking about, is not allowed to have its greenhouse gases emissions counted. That is by congressional mandate. Congress decided biomass is carbon neutral. It is not. But beyond that, as Kathy has pointed out, it has a direct impact on frontline communities, not only here in America, but across the world. And I believe uh, if you didn't already know it, and I'm, I assume almost everybody who's <laughs> joined us tonight already did, but if you didn't already know it, Candy and Kathy's uh, presentations tonight have really made clear that these issues aren't just abstract issues. The issues of dirty energy in a clean energy standard, in a clean so-called clean energy standard, are issues that directly impact the health and well-being of people who are our friends, our neighbors, and we must look out for one another. Next, I want to introduce Kyle White. Kyle is the George Willis Pack Professor of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. 
His research addresses environmental justice, focusing on moral and political issues concerning climate policy and indigenous peoples, the ethics of cooperative relationships between indigenous peoples and science organizations, and problems of indigenous justice in public and academic discussions of food sovereignty, environmental justice, and the Anthropocene. He has served as an author of the US Global Change Research Program, including authorship on the fourth National Climate Assessment. Kyle also currently serves on President Biden's White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Kyle. Bonjour, everybody. Good to have a chance to uh, share and be in dialogue. I'm, I'm a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, and it's also good to be in consultation with the Indigenous Environmental Network. I respect profoundly what our colleagues Candy and Kathy brought before us here today. I will discuss ethics and justice regarding false solutions. And I wanna begin with information about the context. Tribal nations and indigenous organizations in coalition with many communities of color, we seek true collective self-determination and justice in the energy transition. We must be in the position to model a transition to a deeply participatory, ethical and renewable energy system that fosters well-being. A real renewable electricity standard is simply non-negotiable. Right now, technological and industrial solutions to climate change are being considered. They involve both. One, plans for new technologies to be deployed widely. And two, plans for old dirty technologies associated with coal and industrial intensive agriculture. Remember the stories of many of our communities. We have been cut out of most US technological investments in the past, including, for crying out loud, electrification, creating decades of disinvestment in technology and infrastructure in our communities. As has been well documented, we have suffered greatly health-wise, economically, and socially from dirty technologies, and will continue to endure suffering every day if such industries remain operative. These are the stories behind the situations that must be improved if climate solutions are to make a difference. That our goals are self-determination and justice in the wake of generations of disinvestment in our communities and peoples puts in stark contrast climate change solutions that seek to coddle wealthy corporations and resource extraction industries tied to harmful emissions and hazards or climate solutions that play into situations where government regulation and community voices and knowledge is unlikely to be adequate, hence false solutions. So I encourage people, based on some of the brief points I'm gonna share, to further consider the evidence from community knowledge and experience, indigenous knowledge, and actual credible, rigorous academic expertise, not academic advisement commissioned by industry without adequate peer review, community review, transparency and criticism, or even just openness to public scrutiny. So in terms of some specific cases, you know, recently the 26 members of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council produced recommendations on environmental justice, including the Justice 40 initiative. And in that rec set of recommendations, there's a key section that states it pretty straightforwardly. Examples of the types of projects that will not benefit a community. Some of what's mentioned are projects extending the lifespan of fossil fuel industries, carbon capture and storage, nuclear power. So what about some of these false solutions? Carbon capture and storage literally storing emissions from coal so that they don't immediately go into the atmosphere, extends dirty industries. And yeah, you heard that right, coal. It requires pipeline networks for transport, bearing painful and familiar risks. It generates new hazards, such as emitting additional pollutants. Carbon capture and storage, which by the way is costly, can be implemented near communities of color and economically stressed communities who will bear the burdens. Nuclear energy, it, it's not clean. <laughs> it's associated with radiation and substantive carbon footprint by contrast to renewables. Nuclear is associated with massive resource consumption, such as with water, 
and negative externalities across its whole supply chain. Uranium mining continues to be associated with environmental injustice. But let me discuss several more false solutions. Large hydropower. Large dams can displace communities nearby. That, that issue never went away. The reservoirs produce methane in some contexts like the site C Megadam in Canada, it's associated with providing energy in ways that overtake indigenous people's own development of real renewable energy. Dams affect fish such as salmon runs can exacerbate climate change issues like drought. Another one, biogas, which converts waste into energy is actually meant to extend already inequitable intensive agriculture industries. Industries that have been harmful to local farmers, including saddling farmers of color with debt. Concentrated animal feeding operations, capos, such as resource intensive hog farming are long connected with environmental injustice, burdening communities of color and economically stressed communities. Waste produces methane which then must be transmitted nearby to communities. And it's unclear how low pressure transmission lines will be constructed in ways that do not bear further risks to nearby communities. Carbon capture and storage, nuclear, hydropower, and biogas. <laughs> we can't possibly support these. These solutions do not produce community empowerment, whether in terms of self-determination or justice. They do not alter the continuance of the story where technological exuberance excludes diverse communities and peoples and coddles ethically and equitably problematic industries and government programs. Thank you, Kyle. We did have a question in the Q and A also about um, the factory farm gas or biogas, which which Kyle addressed, but I believe um, is also going to be addressed directly in the Q and A. One of the additional concerns with factory farm gas that we, in particular here at Food and Water Watch, have is that it incentivized the continued consolidation of factory farms in our country by giving an out for the waste stream, but also incentivizing new farms to be built to take advantage of a digester that's been built and therefore increasing the concentration of factory farms and communities. It's not a clean energy source. It is a way to try to monetize a, a harmful and dangerous waste stream. Thank you, Kyle, for highlighting that. And thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you for your work on the White House Environmental uh, Justice Advisory Council. Our final speaker tonight is Jean Sue. Jean is the Energy Justice Program Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, where she oversees and develops the Energy Justice Program's campaigns dedicated to hastening the clean, democratic energy future so urgently needed to protect wildlife, communities, and the climate. Before joining the Center, Jean worked as a Renewable Energy Project Finance Attorney and in the climate change and international development fields in Africa and Asia. And in addition to being a huge ally on climate. Jean's also a great ally of ISA in the fight against water privatization and water shutoffs. So Jean, <laughs> it's always great to have you. And thank you. Take it away. Thank you. And we won't even start talking about the privatization of our public goods. That that we need to fight uh, with, with full, full teeth right now, uh, because that's another forefront. Um, I, I guess I just want to back up and say I'm deeply honored to be on this panel with such incredible, incredible people uh, who are fighting the dirty energy industry that is our current status quo. It is dirty, it is violent, and it is deeply, deeply racist. Uh, and so we are all in this fight together. Um, I think when we take a step back and just really soak in the incredible stories and information that we just heard, we see a, a very clear understanding of what it means to live in this country today and what it means for fracked gas, for biomass and for nuclear and large hydro and all the things that everyone has just talked about and those serious, deep, violent implications of those. How and why this matters right now is because we actually have the chance to make something new and make uh, an energy system that is better, a whole lot better. This is one of our only, um, literally the climate emergency clock is ticking and we only have literally nine more years to get this right or it is literally game over for the planet uh, and for, you know, for all of our communities here. 
So what is the fight that's going on right now? Why have we called everybody to this um, important moment in time? What's happening right now uh, in Congress and you know, on the Hill, I'm currently in DC in, 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 a <laughs> in the tiny shoe box that I'm living in. <laughs> and here's my little washing machine behind me. Um, what's happening just down the street uh, from me is that Democrats in particular are actually trying to pass a clean electricity standard for this country in the name of climate. And I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, well, that sounds good, a clean energy standard. That sounds so much better than we, what we had under Trump. Those words are quite deceiving, the definition of a clean energy standard. In fact, that term clean energy standard was actually first perpetuated on the Hill by Lindsey Graham in 2009. And it was actually in response to the renewable energy standard, which had been proliferating around the country. So if you don't, uh, well, no, even if you do live in DC, um, but wherever you are in the country, your state may have a renewable energy standard, which um, started in the 1990s, essentially. And it was pretty transparent about trying to get more renewable energy on the grid. And by renewable energy, it did mean wind, it meant solar. It was pretty clear that it wasn't gas. And in some areas, unfortunately, it still um, has biomass in it. But at least it was clear what was in and what was out. In response to that, Lindsey Graham and the Republicans created the clean energy standard as the alternative. And the original inception and existence of a clean energy standard is to include gas, nuclear, uh, and other dangerous technologies like biomass, like carbon capture and storage that essentially perpetuate our oil and gas status quo. So fast forward, you know, we're now in 2021 and we have this same debate raging right now on the Hill. A lot, ton of Democrats right now are trying to push out a clean electricity standard. And they're trying to stamp out the idea of a renewable energy standard. Well, let me tell you what is in the current proposals on the Hill for the clean electricity standard. Frank Pallone has come out with a clean electricity standard that would absolutely allow fracked gas to continue in this country. And as Mitch was saying, the, um, our, our friends at Friends of the Earth uh, did a, and, the, and an ex-EPA um, expert did a very thorough analysis of what that would exactly entail. It would actually allow for 187 of our current gas plants to still keep pumping. And those 187 gas plants would actually allow for 67% of the gas uh, pollution that exists right now to still keep going. So that is not okay. And that is what the current clean one clean electricity proposal is going to allow for. And other clean electricity proposals are absolutely in the same boat as allowing for fracked gas, for biomass, for nuclear, and for other devastating energies uh, that everybody here on this call has talked about. So what have you know all of us done in response to that? There's been a lot of momentum about this clean electricity standard, and even President Biden has come out to say that he is pro a clean electricity standard. So in response, 700 organizations, um, including most of those on this call, came out and said, no, we do not want a clean electricity standard. We know what a clean electricity standard means. We know how deceitful that term is. Instead, we want a renewable energy standard to actually take this moment in time to rebuild a just and truly renewable energy standard that stops perpetuating the racist status quo that we are living in. That is what uh, thousands, literally members that uh, form these 700 groups, millions of members around the country have stood up for. That's the fight that we're in right now. And a couple of days after this letter was released, um, Kyle and his colleagues at the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, as Kyle was saying, released a letter, uh, a, a, basically a, a set of recommendations that absolutely encapsulated what those 700 organizations uh, were, were saying, except it was coming from the mouths of the nation's greatest environmental justice warriors and leaders. So in all of that, and in all of that public people power, uh, how the White House responded was, was quite disturbing. Uh, Gina McCarthy came out a couple of days later and said that she had read uh, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council recommendations, but that she was still going to do an all above approach, that they were open to the gas, to the carbon capture and storage, to the nuclear, 
to all of the things that have devastated what everybody on this call has been talking about. And so the reason we're here right now is because this is on fire on the Hill right now. This is actually the fight uh, that all of us are part of. We at this point cannot afford some type of clean electricity standard that is embraced by Democrats, by the White House, that simply allows for the devastating fracked gas, the fatal biomass, the absolutely uh, heinous, at this point, heinous nuclear, nuclear waste, the carbon capture and storage that allows oil and gas to keep forward. All of those types of energies will be embedded if a clean electricity standard is passed. So we have to fight back. Um, and we can do that in many different ways. Just yesterday, a, um, an alternative bill was actually proposed in the House that was proposing a renewable energy standard. Um, it isn't as ambitious in terms of timeline as we like, but it certainly had the right energies in it, except for biogas, it had biogas still in it. Um, but that, that is right now um, the one of the alternative proposals. But really, we have to mobilize and actually get ourselves um, totally in in conversation with offices to say that we are not going to stand silent to allow for the oil and gas industry uh, to keep ruling Capitol Hill and, and keep uh, motivating Democrats to vote the way they are. So a couple of things are happening that we would love for you to all get involved with. Um, one of the most significant things that can be done uh, is that we are all um, collectively mobilizing to do lobby days um, lobby days both in district as well as at this point zoom calls with with folks on the hill to basically take a stand and say the clean electricity standard is not okay and we don't accept that and we are organizing we're organizing for mid-july right now uh, for folks from everywhere around the country to come together and meet with your senators um, with your house reps both in district and out to get this message across that America simply can't accept this any further. Um, and so with that, I know there's a lot, there's a lot of questions and we absolutely have um, sign up sheets for people uh, to get folks mobilized and organized to make this happen. And there's, there's other things we can do as well. But with that, uh, with 15 minutes to go, I'll zip it and, and turn it back over to Mitch and this incredible panel. Thank you, Jean. I always appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> That's why I told you you were coming last uh, to keep us all engaged. Um, and there is, as as Jean said, this is this is the debate that is happening right now in Congress when it comes to climate. This and ending fossil fuel subsidies, and everybody should also tell their member of Congress to support ending fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, if everybody on the panel could just please turn back on your cameras, we're going to take some questions from. Uh, our attendees now. Um, several um, questions were submitted ahead of time. And so I wanna make sure that we get a chance to get to the questions that, that folks had asked. I think um, the, the one that's kind of directly relevant to what Jean was just saying, and several people asked a version of this question, isn't something better than nothing, right? We're being told this is the moment we can act a CES with these dirty energy sources might be the best thing we can get. Isn't this something that we should take now and try to fix later? This is a common question. We hear it all the time. I have reporters ask me, Kyle, I see you unmuted, so I'm going to toss it to you first. Go ahead, Kyle. <laughs> People need to put this in context. Every single time that colonialism, racial capitalism, and other forms of oppression have operated, they say that same thing. For 200 years against native people, oppressors, colonists have said that same line. And what is at stake for many of our communities is the idea that climate solutions would only benefit privileged people, would only benefit certain communities. They will experience a net carbon zero world or a carbon zero world. But our communities, even if overall globally there's less carbon, uh, and less greenhouse gas emissions, our environmental reality will actually be worse than the one we're even experiencing right now, which again, is not a reality given the struggles our communities have that any of us wants to remain in, let alone make it worse. Thank you, Kyle. Jean, 
or sorry, oh, Kathy, you had, un you had unmuted sorry. first. Kathy, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to put in a note about carbon capture sequestration uh, because the world's largest uh, carbon capture sequestration was planned uh, in Kemper County, Mississippi. Again, if I gave you the stats, 78% African-American, over 50% poverty rate. It was a failed experience. I was one of the 186,000 rate payers in that area. Um, our governor at the time was a former lobbyist for the Southern Company before he became governor. After he became governor, he had the um, legislation. Uh, he introduced um, or had legislation introduced that he backed that would have the ratepayers to pay for uh, this plant before it was even built. And so corporate arrogance had them to keep going over and over and over, um, over budget, over time, till it got to seven and a half billion dollars. If you do the math, it's very expensive. It's temporary. It's experimental. If you do the math on seven and a half billion dollars, uh, we say we can't afford clean energy. But if you do the math on that uh, and divide 186,000 rate pairs, it comes out to um, over $35,000. Every rate pair could have had rooftop solar and a battery for, for the amount that they were um, uh, charging for the carbon capture sequestration plant. So it's not that we can't afford um, clean energy. Um, it's just that we need to find the right 12-step program to wing everyone off fossil fuel. Gene, I know you were gonna you were gonna address this as well, but can I ask you to also because we've gotten this question in the Q and A and had it uh, ahead of time as well to also just kind of briefly address okay if we don't want these things <laughs> what is the 100% renewable energy it's it's laid out in the letter that we've addressed but if you could um, just just kind of quickly go through what is it that we envision um, you know in a minute or less uh, the energy system looking like as well as addressing this direct question of isn't this better than nothing thanks Jean yeah of course um, and so I think those two questions come hand in hand uh, isn't this better than nothing? I think the response for that is to whom, who? Better for who? Uh, I think every every Congress member should listen to this webinar and uh, be face to face with Candy, Kathy, and Kyle on a day to day basis. Uh, because why? I, I often find the people who say that are the people who will not suffer or feel the harm and who have not suffered or felt the harm of our current energy system and how violent it is. Um, so I challenge those people on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are the people uh, who do not have to compromise, who have compromises okay for people who are not being um, treated like expendable uh, objects, which has completely happened during COVID as well with essential workers. Um, so I, uh, yeah, so that, that's just one um, response. I think the other response to it is that actually we have everything we need right now to whip out a new energy future that actually can address our racial and colonial uh, disgraceful histories. Um, and we have the ability uh, to do that with the technologies we already have. And what that looks like, uh, it, it's, it's been modeled by many different people and it can range from proven technologies like wind and solar, but in particular, uh, it's been shown, and sorry to go technical on people, but it has been shown that rooftop solar uh, and storage can actually fulfill nearly 80% of our energy needs right now, that that has come out from federal labs. And essentially what that means is that every single household uh, could be freed from utility rate payer uh, abuses. Uh, it can be affordable. It, it is also clean. It will not be poisoning people in their backyards. It will bring local jobs back to communities that have been devastated. And at the end of the day, those technologies are also allowing people to be resilient during the climate disasters that are hitting this country on a day-to-day -day basis. It's been shown and proven that folks in the Southeast when they've been hit with hurricanes have been able to survive because of technologies on their rooftop um, and through wildfires in California. And that access to electricity is absolutely vital to keeping people alive during heat strokes, heat waves with medicines that you need to be refrigerated. So what we're looking at here is actually a far more 
robust, flexible, and resilient energy future that isn't reliant on some type of geotechnical fix that we have no idea about. There's actually proven stuff right here, and we just need the political will to actually make it happen. Thank you, Jean. Appreciate that answer. One additional thing I'll say to that, and then I'm, I've got another question for Candy, and we'll also let Candy address this one, um, is when I'm asked uh, about, about this, you know, and people say, well, shouldn't we get something now and then go back and fix it? If you really think about the political reality, we're not going to get a chance to fix it. We got one moment to get it right, and we have to get it right now because this is the time for us to act. And if we get it wrong, we're going to be locked in with these dirty, harmful, polluting energy sources for decades to come. So if we're going to act, let's get it right now. Candy, in addition to addressing the, the previous questions, we had another question that I think um, you would be uh, the right person to direct to. So um, Ken asked us, whoops, sorry, wrong question. Sharon asked us, um, what are some of the names and phrases that are used in these kind of, uh, she called them false flag <laughs> proposals or programs so that we can recognize them? In other words, when you hear certain words that should alert you that what you're being told isn't the thing that's being described. Can you maybe in addition to answering the previous question, talk a little bit about things to look out for to know that you're being sold a, a false uh, bill of goods? Mm -hmm. That's a really difficult one because the devil is in the details inevitably when it comes to these huge, thick portfolios that are often put together for people. And the big words are the usually the bad words, but then it's says things like clean, clean energy standard. How do you know that you should look out for the word clean? <laughs> and so that's what I mean by you have to go and dig deeper. I mean, we're also fighting against carbon trading, you know, at the Indigenous Environmental Network. And we have to deal with this program called RED, reducing emissions of deforestation and destruction. I can't even say it because it's such, it's, it's wrong. And, and it's all about, oh, by the way, we're going to take pollution from here and put the pollution over there. And it's all the same pollution, but it's just in a different location. And it's a mess. Even the word green, you know, you we the Green New Deal has changed significantly since IAN has gotten on board and pushed for the Thrive Act and pushed for things that actually work for us in our communities. We speak for ourselves. We don't need other people to make these choices for us. We just need them to listen to us as we speak for ourselves. So that's a very tricky one. You kind of have to watch out for these words that seem um, no threat, really. And then say, hmm, I'm going to dig a just a little bit deeper and just read a few paragraphs. And then you'll start to see the devil is in the details. Certainly with nuclear has always been called a clean energy. Tell that to my Diné friends in Navajo country who still have people being born to this day impacted by the radioactive um, materials that have been put under the grounds there and contaminated water sources. It's, it's crazy. But overall, big picture, everybody, is this. We're not talking about continuing the energy level that we have now. We have to be, the just transition is using energy in a much more efficient way and in a much more decreased way. Why does Las Vegas need to be lit up 24 seven? It doesn't because they shut down during COVID so they wouldn't lose money and they were perfectly fine. There's this whole capitalistic model of colonization that's in our minds because we're born into it in the United States and in other places. Even I, being born on a reservation and raised on a reservation, have more privilege than people in other countries and third world countries. But do we understand that when we turn that tap water on, that's a privilege? Do we understand that we might not know what to do if we turned that tap on and water didn't come out one day? Or you walked into a grocery store and the shelves weren't lined with food one day? You have to get back to these basic necessities of learning how to live, to feed yourself, and to not be so reliant on some outside source of energy or food production, because that has what has become of us as people in the United States. We've become just trapped by capitalism. And, and our minds have been colonized to believe that we need it. We need it. We need it. And we don't. We've, we live for thousands of years without these things that we have now, and certainly some of it, but not all. So big picture thinking, I would ask everybody to just go small scale, 
go back to the basics, plant a garden, even if you're in a city, put some tomatoes in a pot as a starting point and really begin to understand how you survive as a person on this planet without making death for others in order to do so. Thank you, Candy. I wanna thank uh, Candy, Kathy, Kyle, and Jean for being our incredible and incredibly moving and powerful panel this evening. I recognize that there were a variety of other questions both submitted beforehand and during uh, the conversation tonight that we did not get a, a chance to address and I apologize for that, but we are running up against uh, our time limit and I wanna end by uh, giving people an action they can take. So uh, my colleague Thomas is gonna put up a slide for us where there is a phone number and a script where you can call your Senator and tell them that you want a truly renewable energy standard and not a clean energy standard that includes dirty and false solutions. There you see it, it's the take action slide. Call your senators and tell them to keep dirty energy out of a renewable energy standard. You can see the script, you can see the phone number, it's 855-572-9495. If you call that number, you will get connected to your senators. 855-572-9495. And Thomas will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we're gonna be sending a follow-up uh, email to attendees tonight that will also contain this information. We need you to call your Congress member tomorrow. And yes, everybody's gonna get an email. Okay, I was right. Tomorrow, we need you to call. We need you to call next week. As Gene said, this debate in Congress is happening now. We need you to reach out to your senators, to reach out to your members of Congress, to reach out to your family and your friends and get them to make phone calls too. Because the way that we're going to win this is by getting everyone involved in this campaign who is willing to stand up and say, I want truly renewable energy, no fracked gas, no biomass, no new nukes, no new massive hydropower no factory farm biogas, no biomass. You can also see that there is from uh, Center of Biological Diversity, a link there uh, that is going to be sent around as well. And we will also send around links as Jean uh, had indicated for um, uh, grassroots lobbying meetings with members of Congress. So you will be getting all of that in an email after this webinar. This webinar has also been recorded and will be made available on YouTube. It's been streamed on Facebook. We've run out of time. I just really want to thank everybody who attended tonight. Again, I want to thank our panelists. These were very powerful presentations, very informal presentations. I want to thank everybody who asked a question. I apologize again for those of you whose questions we were not able to get to. And I wish you all a good evening and I hope you enjoy Juneteenth tomorrow as best you can, recognizing the end of slavery in the United States. Thank you.